you. As usual, I have a brief opening statement. It will take about five to seven minutes to read it. And after that, uh, Dr. Gaurav Vallabh will give the gist of it in Hindi, and then we'll take questions. The budget for 2023-24 and the budget speech of the Honorable Finance Minister show how far this government is removed from the people and their concerns about life, livelihood, and the growing inequality between the rich and the poor. Let me begin by pointing out with regret that the FM has not mentioned the words unemployment, poverty, inequality, or equity anywhere in her speech. Mercifully, she has mentioned the word poor twice in her speech. I'm sure the people of India will take note of who are in the concerns of the government and who are not. Let me turn to the numbers. Last year, the government estimated the GDP for 2021-22 at rupees 232,14,703 crore and assuming a nominal growth rate of 11.1%, projected the GDP for 22-23 at rupees 258 lakh crore. The GDP for 21-22 has since been revised upward to rupees 236 lakh 64,637 crore. In today's budget papers, the GDP for 22-23 has been estimated at rupees 273, 7 lakhs 751 crore, which yields a growth rate of 15.4%, much above the earlier estimate. Given this impressive numbers, real GDP ought to have grown in double digits. Yet the FM and the Economic Survey put the GDP growth at only 7% this year. Will the government explain? The claim of real GDP growth is on the face of lower capital expenditure. Please see the following numbers. In the current year, the BE and RE numbers, capital expenditure was budgeted at 7,50,246 crore. Revised estimate is lower at 7,28,274 crore. Grants for creation of capital assets was estimated at 3,17,643 crore. Revised is 3,25,588 crore. The effective capital expenditure was estimated at 10,67,889 crore, but revised downwards to 10,53,862 crore. Please note that both capital expenditure of the central government and the effective capital expenditure are lower than the budget estimates. So what drove growth in 22-23? We know that private investment is down, exports are down, and private consumption is stagnant. So how does the government explain the 7% growth in the current year? Besides, in 22-23, the growth rates in Q1 and Q2 have been estimated at 13.5% and 6.3% respectively. So we already have 9.9% .9 growth in the first half of the year. If the whole year will only yield 7%, does that mean that Q3 and Q4 will record growth rates of only 4 to 4.5%. For the whole year, therefore, quarterly GDP growth rate is sliding. 13.5, down to 6.3, down to 4.2, and then eventually down to 4.0. There are other numbers which are disconcerting. The lesson to be drawn is that the government is not spending what was promised on key schemes. 
Now, I've given the numbers in the BE and the RE. Just look at the numbers. Agriculture and allied activities, 83,521 crore, down to 76,279 crore. PM Kisan, 68,000 crore to 60,000 crore. Education, 104,278 crore to 99,881 crore. Health, 86,606 crore to 76,351 crore. Social welfare, 51,780 crore to 46,502 crore. Urban development, 76,549 crore to 74,546 crore. This is shocking. Umbrella scheme for development of scheduled caste, 8,710 crore to 7,722 crore. Scheduled tribes, 4,111 crore to 3,874 crore. Minorities, 1,810 crore to only 530 crore. And other vulnerable groups, 1,931 crore to 1,921 crore. Now look at transfer to state. What was promised was 3,34,339 crore. But what will be tr tr transferred is only 2,70,936 crore. Where have the remaining 64,000 crore gone? No taxes have been reduced, except for the small number who have opted for the new tax regime. No indirect taxes have been reduced. There is no cut in the cruel and irrational GST rates. There is no reduction in the prices of petrol, diesel, cement, fertilizers, etc. There is no cut in the numerous surcharges and cesses which are anyway not shared with the state governments. Who has benefited by this budget? Certainly not the poor, not the youth looking desperately for jobs, not those who have been laid off, not the bulk of the taxpayers, not the homemaker, not the thinking Indians who are shocked by the growing inequality, the rise of the number of billionaires, and the wealth being accumulated in the hands of the 1% of the population. And certainly not you. You have not benefited by this budget. This much is clear. The government is determined to push the fortunes of gift city Ahmedabad at the cost of other commercial and financial centers. The government is also determined to push the new tax regime for which there are few takers for a variety of reasons. Besides, making the new tax regime the default option is grossly unfair and will rob the ordinary taxpayer of the meager social security that he may get under the old tax regime. The economic survey listed all the headwinds that the world and India will face, but did not offer any solutions to face these headwinds. The budget speech did not even acknowledge the headwinds. The government is living in its own imaginary world. Three stark facts are acknowledged the world over. One, world growth and world trade will slow down significantly in 2023. For India, it will be 2023-24. Two, many advanced economies will go into a recession. Three, the global security situation, thanks to the Ukraine war and other brewing conflicts, will deteriorate. If all three materialized, what will the government do? What kind of burdens will that place on the people who are suffering owing to inflation and unemployment? There were no answers provided, either in the economic survey or in the budget speech. This is a callous budget that is betrayed. How many, what proportion of taxpayers have moved to the new tax regime? The Income Tax Department is expected to release 
basic data every year. The last data that has been released is only for assessment year 2019-20. Why has the data not been released? How many people have switched over to the new tax regime? How many of you have switched over to the new tax regime? What about those who have not switched over to the new tax regime? Has there been one rupee benefit for them? First, the government must tell us how many of the middle class taxpayers have switched over to the new tax regime. The minor relief that has been given is only for those who have switched over to the new tax regime. For those who are in the old tax regime, there is no concession at all. Targets are meaningless for this government. Look at the opening few paragraphs. They say nominal growth this year has been 15.4%. But they say real growth will be 7%. Now, this is beyond my capacity to understand. <laughs> How can nominal growth be 15.4% and at real growth be only 7%? I mean, somebody must explain. Uh, I'll admit that we are not very well informed, but those who are well informed should explain to us the GDP growth is falling. It was 13.5% in the first quarter, 63 in the second quarter, and according to their own number, the whole year will be 7%. Arithmetically, it works out only to another 8.2% in two quarters. So I've divided it into 4.2 and 4. You can divide it into 4.1 and 4.1. See, allocating more money for capital expenditure is good. Allocating more money for capital expenditure in railway is good. But look at the record of this government. It allocates money for capital expenditure, but spends 22,000 crore less. Will they be able to spend the additional allocation? That is the question. And how many jobs in the railways are vacant? How many exams of railways have been cancelled? So allocating money is not equal to spending the money. Nor is allocating money equal to creating jobs. It's only when you actually spend the money and fill the vacancies, your objective will be achieved. You are absolutely correct. That is their intention. But there is a simpler way of doing that. Just say, after three years or four years, all exemptions will come to an end. Why are you going taking this circuitous route? Simply say all exemptions will come to an end, say by 2027 or 2028, and there becomes one tax regime then. Why do you have an exemption tax regime, a no exemption tax regime, and then say it's a default option? What is all this complicated um, exercise? The ultimate aim of the government is that tax exemptions should be abolished. Tax exemptions give some social security to the middle class today. If tax exemptions are abolished, then there must be a, another mechanism by which the taxpayer gets some social security. The 5.6 crore people have fallen below the poverty line in the last three years, thanks to the pandemic and other reasons. Now to assume that the poor will remain poor and 1% of this country will accumulate the wealth, that's an assumption which we reject as a cruel, cynical assumption. You have to reduce inequality. You have to ensure that the middle class grows you have to ensure that more people below the poverty line go above the poverty line. Please read the Azim Premji University report. Crores of people have been pushed below the poverty line. And whatever middle class there is, you are denying any relief to that middle class unless that middle class taxpayer moves to the new tax regime. And that is a paltry relief. If you do the calculations, and that will burden this statement, you do the calculation, there is really no benefit as 
except in the middle two slabs. There is really no benefit even under the new tax regime. Now, I can't uh, read the mind of the government or the prime minister or the finance minister. It's quite clear that they have forgotten the poor. They have practically forgotten the middle class. So, you can only conclude that they are relying upon other factors and other forces to win an election. Well, I don't know. I, uh, this question should be put to the Prime Minister. Of course, I understand you will never give it an opportunity. But you put the question to the Finance Minister at least. You see, what is promised is 100 days of employment a year. Now, the economic survey says the Mandrega demand has increased. Over six crore households have asked for work. Only 5.7 crore households got work. And the average number of days they got work is 42. So we don't have a full Mandrega. We have got a less than a half Mandrega. They don't get work. All the households don't get work. And even the work they get is only 42 days a year. And every state is saying areas of Magandrega wages are due. So actually, Mandrega is being squeezed from all sides. Don't give work to everybody who demands. Don't give him or her 100 days work and hold back the wages. So it's being squeezed from all sides. Well, I don't know what state got what. You have to... Yeah, but you have to look into it. But the fact is that in 22-23, they promised to transfer 3,34,339 crore. They will transfer only 2,70,936 crore. What is the use of announcing packages if money is not transferred? They have transferred or they will transfer by 31st of March this year 70,000 crore less than what was promised. Now, this is the budget number. They can't transfer any more because once this budget is approved, they cannot transfer anything more than 2,70,936 crore. So the state should be asking, where is the money that you promised us? You promised to transfer 3,34,000 crore. You are transferring only 2,70,000 crore. That is the question which chief ministers must ask. And I hope they will. No, no, that is not, that is not part of the budget speech or the <laughs> budget press conference that you should ask separately. Anyway, the party has already made a statement. Mm -hmm.